you know, do a, an overview of, you know, few macros, uh, you know, looking at our economy and where we are potentially headed. Uh, so we'll start with GDP. So obviously the GDP is a reflection of uh, the productivity of the economy. And in the recently released reports uh, by the MBS, that's the National Bureau of Statistics, uh, we learned that our GDP grew by 2.51% on a year-on-year -year basis as of Q2 uh, 2023. Uh, this is relative to the 3.54% year-on-year growth that was re recorded in the corresponding quarter, that's Q2 2022, right? So on a year-on-year -year basis, we are moving at a slower pace, right? Now, this slower output in our economy, which is the 2.51%, it reflects the consequence of the country's prevalent macroeconomic challenges. We are very well aware of a lot of them, the shortage of FX, the FX illiquidity in our system, also the continuous depreciation of the Naira. Uh, we also cannot omit or ignore the, the cash crunch that's hit our economy, right? But in Q2, what we saw is that there was some recovery Right, there was some recovery on a quarter on quarter basis because as of Q1, which is when the cash crunch hits, our economy suffered, right? Our economy grew by 2.31% in the first quarter. But coming into the second quarter, there was some recovery from that cash crunch. And that ultimately led us to having our GDP uh, for the second quarter of 2023 at 17.72 trillion naira. So that represents a growth of 2.51%. Now, our GDP, of course, is divided into two, typically. They, we have the oil sector, we have the non-oil sector. Now, the oil sector, that has remained depressed uh, for quite some time. Uh, we saw crude oil prices rally between $73, uh, $73 per barrel to $83 per barrel uh, between April and June of this year. But with the continuous incessant decline in our, in our crude oil production volume, it has remained a significant drag to the sector's performance, despite the relatively favorable crude oil prices, right? We also have seen consistent and increased levels of uh, uh, arbitrage activities, you know, oil thefts, pipeline vandalism, illegal oil mining, and with all of these factors, it has led to us averaging an output of about 1.38 million barrels per day as of the second quarter of, of 2023. Yes, this is an, an improvement from where we are coming from. I mean, if you're looking at uh, just going into 2023, we're not even doing up to a million barrels per day at a point, right, in the last quarter of last year. So whilst, yes, we are that this is an improvement, but it is still low, it is still quite low. Nigeria has a potential production capacity of about 2.3 million barrels per day. So this is still quite low by about a million barrels per day. So this, uh, this quarter, Q2 2023, it marks the 13th consecutive decline in our oil sector. It marks the 13th consecutive decline in our oil sector because our oil sector has had a negative growth that is contracted by 13.43% as of uh, Q2 2023. And this is even worse than the first quarter of 2023, whereby we saw a contraction of only 4.21%. So it is clear that our oil sector is a significant drag on our economy, right? It's a significant drag on our economy. And there are projections that even if we're doing a, a positive, if we're doing a positive uh, a growth in our crude oil, uh, in our crude oil uh, uh, space, in our oil sector, Maybe we're doing, uh, you know, let's say it directs 180. That is, we're doing 13.43% growth, right? We'll definitely see our crude, our GDP, you know, in a more favorable favorable position. So what we've seen is that the International Energy Agency, that's the IEA, they've projected a likelihood of upward trajectory in global prices for the year. And with this taking into account, as well as some of the efforts that the governments have you know, promise they were made. Of course, you know, we know that, as I mentioned earlier, we've, we've seen 13 consecutive declines in our GDP, but of recent, we saw that our crude oil production 
has improved slightly, you know, and we attribute that to some of the uh, steps that have been taken by uh, by the current administration in order to curb all theft and uh, illegal mining uh, activities. We have seen our crude oil production go up to about 1.6 million barrels per day, right? Uh, as of last month, you know, according to what was reported by by OPEC. So there is some uh, slight improvement there, and as well as, of course, the improvements or upward trajectory in global crude oil prices. What we expect is that going forward, we should see that our oil sector would be in a better position than it is, right? So we expect a, a moderate recovery for the oil sector. We expect that we'll still be in a contraction, mind you, right? But it won't be as steep as this 13.43% that we, that we currently have. Now, the second part of our economy, which is non-oil sector. On the non-oil front, the service sector remained robust. Right, profit profiting from the 34.6 percent year-on-year increase in credit accretion to the uh, to the financial services sector, which grew by 26.8 percent, and the positive pass-through uh, from increased cross-border activities and enhanced e-commerce channels in the trade sector, which grew by 2.4 percent year-on-year. So, really, it's the non-oil sector of our economy that is that is driving our our economy. Now, within the non-oil space, there's some weakness in the ICT sector. The ICT sector moderated to 8.6% uh, to, uh, year on year, which is a four quarter low. So over the last quarter, this is the lowest that we've recorded in our ICT sector. And we can attribute that to the decline in telephone subscribers, right? The decline in telephone subscribers and the teledensity within that, within that space. Also, you could also you know, take into account the the decrease in work from home structures, because a lot of people are, are going back to working from home, right? That also led to the, the slight slowdown in the ICT sector. Uh, in the agricultural space, uh, that rebounded from the effects of the Naira illiquidity, you know, when we had the, the cash crunch, uh, that recorded 1.5% growth uh, as of uh, Q2 2023. And the manufacturing sector, uh, that sustained a growth trajectory. It grew by 2.2%, and you could owe that to the expansion of the of the uh, product lines by from by some FMCG players. So uh, generally, uh, the non-oil sector is what is really boosting our or what is really driving in our economy. Pardon me, uh, and the and the oil sector is what is what is dragging it back. Right, is what is dragging it back significantly. Now, in our in our outlook. In our oil sector, uh, in the oil and terminal shortings, the the aging infrastructure, the pipeline maintenance uh, issues, you know, that has led us to uh, so, uh, tip our oil production uh, uh, to the 1.32 million barrels per day, which we saw in the second quarter of the year. Uh, what we've seen is that the general expectation is for our sector to remain in the negative region, right? So like I mentioned earlier, although we expect to see uh, an improvement, we still expect to for the oil space to still remain in, in a contraction, uh, contraction, just like we've seen uh, for the last uh, over 10, 10 quarters in a row. However, there's some optimism uh, with regards to uh, the oil sector, but that will be towards the last quarter of the year. Uh, we are seeing some uh, uh, some oil wells that are being drilled, even by some independent, uh, uh, some national independent uh, indigenous, excuse me, indigenous oil companies like Seplat. Uh, they completed five uh, oil well drillings. Uh, we expect that uh, uh, about three of that will begin production uh, as of the last quarter of this year. So expectation is that generally there will be an improvement. In the in the oil sector, but our base case is that it will still remain within that uh, contraction contraction phase. For the non-oil sector, we expect that there will be robust performance. Uh, we expect continuous growth. Uh, we expect that the um, ICT space would would uh, see improvements, and it will benefit from the increased four uh, G and five G coverages. Um, 
uh, we also expect that uh, credit growth will remain elevated. Uh, uh, we know that this expansionary uh, uh, approach, uh, you know, to the to the to the fiscal policy should help to drive more uh, money to the non oil sector and drive uh, the GDP ultimately. So we are more in line with what the World Bank says, which is a two point eight percent. So we expect that our economy will see uh, growth of two point eight percent for twenty twenty three. Um, looking at inflation, of course, uh, inflation has continuously been on the rise, uh, just like it has in many other parts of the world. Uh, issues with regards to uh, food supply, uh, um, uh, supply chain disruptions, um, there was the, the flood and the effects that it had. Um, that's the flood coming in from, from last year, the effects it had on our, uh, on our domestic food prices. Uh, so we've seen that both food and corn inflation has been on the uptrend, right? And that has continued for quite a while. And of course, with price being sticky downwards, and of course, the incessant issues still lingering, and some issues now further exacerbating uh, the the situation for the country. We expect that inflation will continue to remain uh, remain elevated. Of course, uh, one that is quite prevalent and and at the forefront of a lot of people's minds is. The, the the price of uh, premium motor spirits, that's PMS or petrol. Of course, the increase in that price has led to the even uh, to, to a more sharp increase in inflation numbers. And as of July uh, this year, we saw that inflation came in at 24.08%. Um, going forward, we expect that all these factors uh, which I mentioned will continue to linger and continue to keep... Uh, 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 prices elevated and continues to keep uh, inflation elevated. Um, of course, the Naira devaluation, uh, that also poses risk. Um, however, going forward, you know, for the rest of the year, we don't expect it to pose as much risk to the food index itself. Why? Because the, uh, the uh, devalued uh, currency at the parallel markets, which, was, which, which, was, which has been trading over uh, 750, uh, 800 naira for quite a, for quite a long time is the price which food has been imported into the country anyway. So that's a uh, premium or that increase in uh, food inflation or imported food inflation. We don't, ex we don't expect that to be as significant uh, for the rest of the year in terms of its in, in terms of increments. Uh, but uh, um, all things considered, we expect that inflation will come in at 26 between 26 and 28 uh, percent for for 2023. Um, for monetary policy, uh, this is essentially uh, speaking to uh, you know the interest rates and uh, just um, general policy in terms of um, uh, managing liquidity uh, in the system and issues that deal with. Uh, uh, um, uh, um, issues that do with the liquidity, managing liquidity within the system, and, and as well as interest rates. So we generally expect for us to see uh, uh, 25 basis points to 50 basis points hike for the remaining meetings of, of the year. And this is uh, premised on the fact that what we see in Nigeria is that uh, the MPC here, they typically tend to go in line with the global trend. And with the general expectation for the Fed in the US, to further do another hike of about 25 basis points, we could see that the uh, monetary policy in Nigeria could uh, tow that line. Also, we cannot ignore the uh, um, inflation, which we expect to even continue to still be on the rise in light of the different factors which you already mentioned. So um, expectation is that uh, we'll, we'll continue to see uh, a more hawkish stance, more tightening from a monetary policy uh, perspective, and we expect that they will also explore some other tools um, aside from raising the interest rate itself uh, to uh, potentially mop up uh, liquidity within the markets, like uh, uh, using the liquidity ratio and uh, uh, um, or uh, more operations. The Naira, of course, uh, 
I think you know this is very well known how the naira has depreciated significantly uh, over the last uh, in 2023, uh, and of course that is you know due to the fact that uh, we are not seeing enough influx of foreign of foreign capital. Therefore, the ability to back the currency has been significantly withered. That has been significantly uh, 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 suppressed over time, and of course, this links back to you know the low, lower crude oil receipts, lower uh, crude oil proceeds. You know, us just generally not having enough FPIs, FDIs, and and uh, FX inflows into into the country, and um, of course. Uh, at the official markets, we saw that we had been uh, managing the rates at this, from the beginning of the year, whereby it was about uh, 460 naira until the current administration came in in May. And then what we saw was that in June, uh, we saw that uh, we moved on to a managed float and we saw the uh, naira significantly decline, right? So if you look at this chart on our right right hand side, we will see that. Uh, uh, the the IRE FX rate, which is the black line, that significantly uh, depreciated, right? That significantly depreciated from the 460 naira levels to between 730 uh, and 800 naira levels, right? So it's now in a in a managed float. It's now in a managed float at the moment, and uh, what we expect going forward is you know further depreciation in the naira. Why? Because the uh, fundamentals which are supposed to support or back the currency are not pointed towards a, a positive direction at the moment. We are still um, having uh, consistent issues and consistent challenges with bringing FX into the country. Uh, we have uh, a, a, a huge um, debt backlog. We have huge FX backlog, which recently the CBN uh, said that you know they are looking to clear in the in the near term, but that is still there. And if these factors are there, it is a rep it's a repellent for uh, foreign uh, investment into your country, and that is going to further put pressure on your currency. Of course, the parallel market factor is there. The parallel markets, of course, this is not an official rate. This is determined uh, more so by purely uh, demand and supply. Of course, we cannot discount the fact that there's some uh, speculation uh, premium or speculation factor that that goes in there, but it is more reflective of the of the demand and supply uh, dynamics on on the naira, and at the moment that is Hello, Mustafa. Sorry, I can't hear you. Um, I'm, I'm thinking it's your network. I really cannot hear you. Hello? Okay, yeah, please, can you try with share your, Hello? your screen? Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you now. Can you try with sharing your screen, please? Okay, where did you lose me, please? Okay, where did you lose me, please? Hello? Hello? Can, can you just confirm that you can hear me? Yes, Mustafa, we can hear you. You can go ahead. Okay, please, where did you lose me? Can you just confirm where you lost me? You, you were just talking about um, the expectations for currency. All right, thank you. Okay, so, um, yes, they will in the 
rest rates coming at the dollar. At the parallel markets, we expect it to fall. Uh, we are currently speculating uh, about a thousand naira to the dollar. Um, we expect it to, to hover around that figure for the end of the year. At the equities markets, what we've seen is that there's been a, a bullish sentiment, uh, and this was especially following uh, the um, aversion of uh, political risk, uh, that is the electioneering within the within the country. At the start of the year, what we saw is that there was some uh, bearish sentiments. You know, it was it was a lot more volatile. There was some bearish sentiments due to the uh, due to the of course the you know that was when we had the cash crunch. That was when we had all these factors that slowed down the economy to about 2.31% in terms of GDP, uh, GDP growth. Uh, and of course, there was a lot of uncertainty. And uh, what we saw is that uh, after the political risk was, was, uh, was, uh, was, was taken out with uh, the swearing in of the, the new, of the new, uh, of the new administration, we saw that the markets from there has been uh, has been uh, very bullish. So if you look at uh, from uh, from the late May, from late May, we've seen that the market has just been on a you know on a significantly upward trajectory, and that's still the case at the moment. So the yesterday return at the moment stands at thirty three point two four percent, and uh, we are very positive. Uh, especially for banking and oil and gas banking and oil and gas uh, takers so we expect that uh, there should be more positivity towards oil and gas uh, takers the downstream and the upstream uh, at the moment the upstream player is Seplat, and i've mentioned earlier about the activities with regards to drilling oil wells we expect that that should drive some positivity towards the the the, the counter uh, towards the ticker and uh, for the banking players um, at the moment, I think there's some expectation for some from Taiwan banks to release their results. Uh, UBA has not released yet. Zenith Bank has not released yet. Access Corp hasn't released yet. Uh, GT Bank has released, and you know we saw positive uh, a positive uh, performance. And in light of the FX revaluation, uh, a, a lot of investors are bullish on how those uh, banks are going to perform in their results. So we expect that the banking and the oil and gas space should see positive sentiments for, for the year. Uh, for, for the rest of the of the markets, we, we, what we put forth is a, is a cautious, uh, uh, cautious approach uh, because whilst we believe that a lot of the support levels of a lot of these tickers have, have gone up, uh, I think you know that 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 the a lot uh, uh, that that the premium currently. So if you look at the price to earnings ratio, that's the PE ratio, they are a lot more elevated than they were uh, compared. You know when you compare it to six months ago, for example. So we need to be a lot more cautious. Um, however, for banking and oil and gas uh, stakers, we expect to see uh, more positivity. For the fixed income markets. Um, what we expect is that uh, the government is going to take into consideration uh, uh, the, you know, the, the need to uh, drive uh, FPIs into the country. And they're also going to take into consideration fiscal sustainability, uh, the fiscal sustainability. So in light of this, what we are going to see is, is, is uh, an attempt to try and strike a balance. So for bonds, what we expect is that we could see a slight uptick uh, for bonds uh, as we go into the into the end of the year, as the government is looking uh, looking should look there to raise capital as opposed to the the shorter term T bills. So for the shorter term T bills, what we could see is that yields could potentially uh, drop, as we expect there to be generally improved liquidity. So liquidity, we expect to be a significant factor to drive the performance of, of the fixed income markets for this year. And um, currently, uh, with the, uh, with the uh, devaluation, for example, that has improved the FAC 
levels. Uh, I believe it was about 1.9 trillion, but with 900 billion uh, being uh, released at first. So we expect that this would, uh, you know, improve liquidity in the market, and we've seen that reflected in uh, uh, OVN rates and OBB rates. So we expect that, uh, summarily, bonds should see a slight uptick, and uh, T-bills would uh, would drop in yields uh, for the rest of the year. Thank you for listening. Thank you so, so much, Mr. Mustafa, for that enlightening session. Um, thank you so much for giving us a good overview of the economy so far and what to expect in the remaining months of 2023. Right now, I'm going to be introducing our next speaker. He's going to give us more um, strategies on how to invest and how to structure our finances, you know, with the how, outlook that we've seen, you know, what are the investment strategies that you have to imbibe, that you have to leverage in this time to ensure that you're making the right investment. So his name is, his name is Emmanuel Oladipo. I'm going to, okay, so Emmanuel Oladipo is, Emmanuel Oladipo is a dynamic portfolio manager with a first class degree in economics from Obafemi Awolowo University. With four years of experience, he began his career as a product and investment manage, management analyst at Trump Limited, gaining some relevant experience in the venture capital and venture building world in 2021. Emmanuel joined Investment One in 2023, where he continues to contribute to the firm's progress as a portfolio manager. Um, please, with a virtual ovation, can we just welcome Mr. Emmanuel as he takes us for the next 20 minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Emmanuel. We're glad to have you here. Thank you, Toby. Thank you, everyone. Um, so, I mean, I'll be doing more of the um, talk on how, you know, investors tend to behave in, during times like this. And also, um, so so let me just start to 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 set the record straight. So basically, we have um, particular dynamics that investors tend to you know portray investor behavior um, during economic shifts like this. Um, so I mean, I was thinking about it, and one of the things that stood out for me was um, in terms of loss aversion. Um, so basically, you know, loss aversion is a concept in behavioral economics that refers to um, a phenomenon where a real or potential loss is perceived by an individual as psychologically um, or emotionally more than the effect of a gain. So you would um, see my first point, um, just right beside the loss aversion. Um, so it says... Um, I would rather miss out on the gain than lose my money. So um, this is why some investors would rather have their monies um, kept in either their banks or um, also have their monies kept in certain investment vehicles um, than some others. Also, it is why some investors would rather anchor so this is um, they would rather anchor on their losses wait a little longer so so basically it's just it's just the concept that says it, it just refers to you know that psychology so I, I would make an example um with a normal um, human life event so you are to write an exam um, but you would rather not so so if you pass the exam which is a success the psychological the utility yes that's the word the utility the satisfaction that you derive from passing the exam that is getting a success is less than the emotional you know satisfaction that you derive or that you don't derive in this case from a loss. So it, it just tries to tell you, oh, I'll rather avoid a loss than gain. So you will see myself on point says loss avoidance is more important 
than the acquisition of an equivalence gain. So then the next point says psychological impacts of a loss versus gain. So the psychological impact of a loss is greater than that of a gain. So in this case, you focus more on the risk. You are more, um, you know, more, you worry more about the risk rather than the gain, which is, it's, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but there are ways to, um, should I say, overcome this sort of, this sort of um, bias, because it's a bias in behavioral finance. So I will then move to the next behavior that stood out for me when I was um, thinking about how investors tend to behave uh, during economic shifts like this. So um, Oliver Swift, that's what I call it. I called it. Um, so I said investors as Oliver Twist, and we all remember, if you read uh, Oliver Twist, that's um, Charles Dickens' novel, um, where, I, I mean, the only crime, so when people ask for more, um, people tend to call them Oliver Twist, and it was just because at the point in time, Oliver Twist asked for more than he was meant to get. Um, at a point in the book, it was an orphan, and I mean, you know the story. So basically, investors just want more, and they actively seek out opportunities. And it is in the event of seeking out these opportunities that they are now vulnerable to, you know, fraudulent investment schemes. Um, so I have examples of Ponzi and pyramid schemes, which... Um, I would say are quite popular in this part of the world. So, I mean, you you know that you are looking out for returns. You want to get um, something, but you know, there are people who are also strategizing somewhere that how can we reap people of their monies and uh, make cheap money off of them? So the Ponzi and Pyramid scheme, guys, and it's just not the Nigerian thing, it's, it's I mean, the name Ponzi itself is um, from an American Italian. His name is Charles Ponzi. Um, I think around the 1920s, you had that happen. So this guy, I mean, he ran down a lot of people. So you want to see that um, this is just not a Nigerian um, thing. So, um, so these schemes necessarily, so what they do is um, they play on the intelligence of uh, investors but uh, like I, I i rightly um said yeah identifying the schemes it's it's not much of an arduous task if you really think about it because um really if you if you if you if you are to identify a viable or a proper investment vehicle or scheme once you tick certain boxes you ask certain questions um really i don't think you would fall into such um scams because i mean the reason why people fall into such scams you know when i talk to some of my friends and they say oh um this happened one time like i lost this amount of money and i'm like wow why didn't you just tell me i mean i could have picked this for you so on the next slide you will see some of the things that are, i mean because i understand that people looking out for more opportunities that some of these things are, you know, almost inevitable. So on the next slide, um, I've been able to point out certain things that I think you should look out for um, in the event of seeking out more opportunities. And I said, it's not a bad thing. I mean, Mustafa just talked about inflation at some um, elevated points, you know, that's uh, 24s, and you know you get uh, how much are your risk-free uh, investments? Maybe just around twelve, yeah, twelve, twelve percent on the one-year treasury bill. And I mean that's already a negative real return of um, twelve percent. So why would I want to stick to that when I can get more? But as much as I want to do that, I also want to make sure that I watch out for so like i rightly said before popular examples within the nigerian context are ponzi and pyramid schemes 
So first thing you need to, so the title here is uh, uh, identifying these skins. So the first thing you want to look out for is, um, you know, these guys, they always promise returns um, for little or no risk. And that is, um, I wrote there, a defiance of the positive relationship between risk and return. So um, in finance, we basically say that the higher the risk, the higher the return. So if someone is promising you a rate, and it's, it's, it's also making the risk look so small, so, so insignificant, that's a red flag. And you need to um, note that. And secondly, Ah, my name is um, to go investment concepts. Uh, uh, if you put your money with us, you're gonna make um, fifty percent by the end of the year. You know the sale of those things. So, um, I didn't even put that here, but are you registered with um, CAC? They say no. Are you registered with SEC? So you see registration with. Capital market regulators. Are you registered with SEC? Say no. Are you ready? So SEC is the Securities and Exchange Commission um, for Nigeria. The US also has SEC also. The NGX, Nigerian Exchange Group. You don't have, you don't, you're not registered with these guys. You're not the CBN doesn't know you. I can't put my money with you. It's it's just um, it's just what you should do in any way. Because these guys come and tell you that they, they, they will give you what you want. You don't need to worry, you get your money back and all. But in the end, they don't go through the regulators. And when you don't go through the regulators, it obviously means that you want to do fraudulent things. So that's the second thing you need to watch out. So another thing you need to watch out for is what we call liquidity in finance so liquidity basically i want to be able to take my money when i want to take it without losing any significant value um and you know these guys sometimes how people actually get to know um that these things are scams is when they try to take some of their money or all of their money then you start hearing stories then you start hearing uh, we can't pay you now, we can't pay you now. So you should, um, so difficulty removing your money should be a red flag. Um, almost the next point, um, the consistent flow of returns regardless of market conditions. So the market is a cycle, um, the business cycle. It's not every time that things go well. So it's not every time that things will go well. But if someone says it's going to always give you 30%, when things are good when things are bad. So I don't think I should believe such a person. Fifth point, um, evasive answers, little or no communication. You ask a question, oh, there's a dribbling, there's a Maradona um, who on you. Um, they don't talk to you about what you need to know. I don't think that's a good investment scheme. Lastly, see this is a very important thing in finance. Yes, there are complexities to some of the things that we do, but it can be made simple to the layman. So if a person cannot explain an investment process to you such a way that she will then understand, I would advise that you avoid it. If I cannot explain, so it's, they make it look so complex, I would say you avoid it. Generally, a rule of thumb, if you cannot, um, if you don't understand something, it is one of the reasons I will not invest in some asset classes. If I don't understand it, I shouldn't invest in it because my understanding means a lot. Now I um, tend to, you know, place my money and distribute my funds. So this takes me to the next slide, which has to do with understanding, you know, asset classes. And we have a lot of them several several asset classes stocks um you know if i were to pull a pool here not a lot of people might like stocks for a couple of reasons um but in this um session i i, I hope that we are able to change that a little bit so stocks are just um, 
I have a company, you have a company, I have a company, a share of it, you, you own a share of it. Um, basically, let's say in this case, um, let's just triple it down to, you know, public, publicly traded companies, uh, say for example, a Dangote, I can buy a share of Dangote and N of its profits yearly, you know, at certain periods in time, um, stocks are volatile, like really volatile. Um, so the thing is, you know, volatility, I risk, I return, I risk, I loss. Let's put it like that. So, but the thing with stocks is you get to, you know, when a company is five naira today, the value of the company is five naira. When the company you know, gets to appreciate in value. You tend to enjoy that. And when they pay from their profits, so that's capital appreciation. And when they pay from their profits, which is the dividend income, you tend to enjoy off of the profits that are paid out to shareholders. Last point on the stock and equity um, uh, points is, you know, the stock market, almost everywhere in the world, a properly regulated, efficient market is a wealth generator. I mean, just this year alone, in the Nigerian, um, in NGS, NGX, so if you look at some stocks, some stocks are, let me just be modest, 200% up, 300% up. It's a wealth generator. I mean, there are not a lot of asset classes that can generate wealth like stocks. Obviously, it's always good to do the disclaimer. If it's a wealth generator, the other, you can also think about it from the other angle, but let's just stop there. So we move to bonds. So bonds, we have government issued bonds, corporate bonds, euro bonds, euro bonds are more of the, you know, issued in a currency that is not the currency of, the issuer, in this case, Nigeria, you know, if the Nigerian government issues a bond in dollars, it is an euro bond. Um, so basically, you want to be able to understand how this works. Um, so it's also a source of cash, I mean, the source of cash flow. Um, so I said dividends, some people call it, um, so dividends as in, um coupons and principles so when it matures you get your money back would have gotten uh, a couple of coupons year in year out whether semi-annually or annually um so they are also relatively safer than um, stocks and they are more popular so if you don't like to get your ads up there you know it's popular among um, investors with low risk investments you know uh, seek that seek low risk investments, but um, I would also advise that you don't. I mean, it's going to be on my next slide. You don't do well just on one of these because it's it's you know you have to take advantage of everything as they happen. So um, I'll move up onto the mutual funds and ETFs. Um, we have a couple of them in Nigeria, and so I call them collective investment schemes. So. Um, some of these bonds that I've talked about, some of these um, asset classes, it's there's a problem of ah the minimum investment amount you must have. So this is where mutual funds come in. They solve that problem. They also solve the problem of oh ah, I don't want to throw my eggs in one basket. I don't want to just buy stocks alone. So there are several you know kinds of um, mutual funds that solve those problems for you. We also have the work of the portfolio manager. He does everything for you. Um, he, he thinks or she thinks to diversify, to you know, reduce exposure to a particular counterparty. They do all of this for you. So with little amounts, I, I think some mutual funds in Nigeria with just 5K you can um, invest. And I mean, you get something for, your money. So um, cash and cash equivalents, we have bank deposits. I mean, I know a lot of people here do um, that. We have money market funds. It's also a kind of mutual fund. We have short-term treasury bills. We have, uh, um, so, so this 
particular asset class offers liquidity and capital preservation, and it makes them suitable for short-term needs. Uh, commodities are more of an edge against inflation. We have um, you can invest in commodities, um, whether by direct ownership or participation in commodities futures contracts. I mean, we won't go into that today. Uh, so other asset classes, private equity, venture capital, these are like um, very serious stuff, precious metals like gold, palladium, silver, um, collectibles and arts, people invest in all these kind of things, um, hedge funds, crypto and forex. Forex, for example, um, those who like to, you know, edge against um, exchange rates is suitable for them. So. Um, my last slide, we basically are going to talk about um, the possible investment strategies. First, most importantly, portfolio diversification. Yes, we all say that thing, don't put all your eggs in one basket. And it's, it's also true in finance. You need to spread risk. You need to reduce ex exposure to economic volatility. So... You want to, I mean, portfolio diversification respects your risk appetite. It respects your risk appetite. If you um, are not that much of a risk tolerant person, even, even if you are risk tolerant, you should not put all of your money in one asset class. You should not have all of your money. You would miss out on so many things. For example, if you out your just your money in the bank this year, you have missed out on the rally in the stock market. You have missed out on a couple of other things. So hopefully that participation helps you reduce risk. It helps you to spread the risk across asset classes. And I will make an example. If I have just one friend that I depend on for pleasure, for you know, to gist me every time. If I have just one friend, just one, compared to if I have five, when that one person decides not to talk to me for a single day, I will be bored or miserable for that day. But if I have four other people to fall back on, I tell you, I'm not going to have a bad day. So you want to think of portfolio diversification like that. We also move to long and short-term investing. I mean, so the, the, the thing is, they have their advantages, basically. You know, I was discussing with some people this morning, and sometimes for short-term investors, sometimes when you, you know, when you move your money too fast, when you buy, sell too fast, sometimes you, you get to a block where you don't know what to do with the money anymore. I mean, short-term investing is... Um, for example, you need a, a, a sum of money. You can, if, if you've not sold some of those things, you can use them as collateral. So basically, the approach of short-term investor, I mean, if you, you are very spiritual and you have you, you know how to read maybe a, 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 a take so much money from short-term investing, if you are able to time the market. But if you cannot, I would advise, there's so much that you, you would get from investing for longer term. I mean, you get to enjoy a lot of benefits. You get to enjoy a lot of benefits. You get your dividends, which you can even reinvest. Now, I will go on to monitoring and rebalancing. You don't want to invest in something. You know, I ask some people sometimes and say, oh, you've invested in something. Say, what did you, uh, what was that thing that you bought? Say, I bought it two years ago. I don't even know if I still have it. I don't, don't do that. In, a, in times like this, you want to have your eye on your investments. I mean, you don't have to look at it every day. You, if you do that, you tend to fall onto the prey of maybe timing, you know, you, know, you want to sell, you want to buy. Sometimes just leave it. Maybe check per week, maybe check per month, however you like. So rebalancing just has to do with having your investment strategy being dynamic and adaptable. So you know, Mustafa spoke about some promising sectors. 
if you see the opportunity in a sector, you can sell down or even sell all of an investment in an asset class. So you don't want to also be a victim of anchoring bias. That means that because I have this thing, I must always have it. I will sell even if I'm making the loss. There are times when rebalancing can make you take losses in a particular sector or um, stock or asset class. You, when you rebalance, you, you make up for those losses and gain from the one you are doing. You just switch at, so maybe today, um, I had 90% um, fixed income security. I put that in stocks. With that, sector tactical asset allocation, you are able to take um, many of these. So we also have value investing um, and income invest on cash over time. So for, for stocks that pay dividends, you are going to be targeting those kind of stocks. So they give you your dividends every time. At the particular point in that you use it, some people use it to pay school fees. So there's value investing where you can actually, you know, look for a particular sector or a group of stocks that you think. The, the the investment is doing better than it's doing when you first invested. So, I mean, that also applies in times like this, you want to. So my last point, uh, which is, well, you know, George Cotton has to do with past. What should I focus on? Should I focus on the past performance or should I focus on the expected performance? So I also drew a case of um, yield and um, return. So sometimes I see people get confused. Um, what should I look at? So I want to invest in a bond. Should I look at how much it has returned over the year, um, year to date or month to date, or should I look at the yield? Um, so really, I would say that, you know, past, past performance is past performance. You can guarantee, may not guarantee, but it is no guarantee of future results. But you want to look at what you stand to gain when you invest. What, what is the cash flow that you derive from this investment? What is, um, you know, expected performance is also not guaranteed in the, in the real sense. So I want to invest in a mutual fund, a fixed income fund. I want to look at their current yield. Where are you? I, I should not necessarily care about the past return. But the past return also tells me the potential or the, you know, the, the ability of that portfolio manager or that investment to generate return. Also tells me about the perception of um, the investors about this. Um, so lastly, I mean, my point is that your strategy should always be largely goals based and um, if you, you don't use your school fees to do some some things don't use your children's school fees to do certain things um you know we talked about safety so if you are but if you have some money that you may not need in the next one year two years and you can play well with them on some stocks and some other things so um i i hope that i've been able to make some impact um, with my um you know strategies and um, some of the other things I've said earlier. Thank you very much. I will stop here. Wow, that was really, really, really insightful. Thank you so, so, so much, Mr. Emmanuel. Well, I could pick a lot of points from everything that you said. I think what stood out also for me was, you know, the Ponzi scheme and the, how to detect Ponzi schemes. Because I know that the, um, the, as a result of the whole inflation and, you know, the shifts we faced in 2023, a lot of people are vulnerable to Ponzi schemes. A lot of people are vulnerable to, you know, deciding to just say, oh, I'm not going to invest. I'm going to just keep my money so I don't lose it, you know. 
the, the, allowing the fear of what has happened can hold you back. But if you understand how to make profitable investments, even in this time, um, I'm sure that you're going to make it, make it well. So I'm going to be taking the questions now. Um, I'll be directing the questions to some of our panelists and also um, some of our members of staff that are present. So the first one says, and then please, if you have questions, if you have questions, if you took down some points during these sessions and then you want to ask any question on what you know was talked about today, please go to the chat box right now and drop your question. If you need clarification on any of our products or any um, investments that you want to try out, you can also go to the chat box and drop your question. So the first question says, I'm interested in dollar investment, but do not know how to go about it. You need to go and buy the dollar and make deposits in your account or how. So I'm going to be calling on Chingwei to answer this question. So let me just... All right, Chingwei, please, you can go ahead and answer the question. So the person needs clarification, is interested in dollar investment, but does not know how to go about it. Mm -hmm. Okay, good morning all. Thank you first for the question. Um, so the different options, the different dollar denominated products that we have, I the different channels that are also assigned to these products. So what um the first step will really be, you know, opening an account with investment one and speaking to um one of our um excuse me, wealth managers. Once you speak to a wealth manager, you discuss your goals, your plans, the expected returns that we can offer and the timeline to which you're able to hold in the investments. That will guide on the type of investment recommendation they will give. So if um, you're interested, what we can do is we can put an email address in the chat box so that you know you can send us an email and then you know we can take it up from there once we've had a discussion because there's various dollar denominated products or options and then you know what we try to do here is tailor the products that we recommend to the client's needs so that i think that the best thing would be for someone on the team to speak with you and then we can recommend what would um, best for you all right. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much, Ma, for answering that question. Um, like you heard her, you can reach out to us via inquiries at investmentone.com, investment underscore one.com rather, inquiries at investment underscore one dot com. So just reach out to us via email. We'll be sure to answer your question and give you the direction that you need. Thank you. So I'm going to be taking the next question now. Um, okay, I think this seems more like a comment. Okay, my name is Mrs. Fawzia, a lecturer from University of Lagos Real Estate Economics. Okay, thank you. She says thank you to the speakers and um, the panelists for the amazing session. All right, so if you have more questions, please, you can put them on the chat box. Or otherwise, if you want to ask directly, you want to make personal inquiries, feel free to reach out to us via email at inquiries at investment-one.com. Um, I would also put it on the chat box now, so you can just copy and reach out to us via email. And in the absence of any other question, I'm going to call on Mr. Tomiwa Oduni to take the Closing remarks. Mr. Tamara, you have the floor, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Um want to use this um, opportunity to thank everybody that was able to join us on this call. Um at Investment One, one of the things we prioritize is investment education. We have told ourselves that we will be at the forefront of educating our, our clients and the public on various investment um, decisions and various investment options they can take. So on behalf of the board, the management, um, and staff of investment, I want to say a very big thank you to our panelists and everybody that was able to join us on this call. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day. Thank you.
Thank you very much for the closing remarks. Thanks to everyone that joined. We really appreciate you to enjoy the rest of your day.